Hey guys, guys, you're going to have to stop the game. Okay, you can play in the Skittles area if you want, but we can just close the door in between. Um, just so you know, we're presenting this presentation to you guys, and this is the biggest audience we've ever had, which is cool. But in addition, we're trying to broadcast this live. So actually, there's a stream on YouTube right now where, I don't know, dozens, maybe hundreds of people are going to be watching this live. And then later on, this will be recorded and put on the YouTube channel and... and um, and you'll be able to look back at it later or show other people and say, look what you were a part of sort of thing. But anyway, uh, because of that, um, you're going to have to stay fairly quiet, okay? Because the sound that you make can be picked up by this pretty sensitive microphone and everybody will hear it and it will be part of the recording and it'll, you know, your, your silly joke or whatever will be stuck there for eternity. So um, let me give you a little context about how this lecture happened. Um, at our last lecture, which was on Akiva, Rub Akiva Rubinstein back in April, we always ask people who attend for suggestions about what we want to cover. And the request for this time was uh, the history of blindfold chess. Okay, so history of blindfold chess. So I, um, I was at Super Nationals and Timor was there. Sorry, let me get this book that I used for Timor was at the at Super Nationals, and I tried to meet up with him, but you know he was kind of, as you might imagine, getting mobbed by hundreds of kids wanting his autograph and adults. And um, so I wasn't really able to chat with him, but I was able to get in touch with him by phone. And I said, "Hey, I am an amateur chess historian preparing a lecture on the history of blindfold chess, and um, I thought it would be really cool to get your take on the history of blindfold chess because here he is." the current world record holder in blindfold chess, which we'll get to. And, and he was very forthcoming, giving me all sorts of answers, you know, about what he thought of kind of the history of blindfold chess and the practice and all that. And, and I thought it'd be really interesting if we could get him here to participate in the lecture. And he said, well, you know, that's an idea. But he said, I have a, another idea. What if we tried to set a world record? Um, and he started to explain tandem blindfold uh, simuls, and this was something that I didn't know anything about, right? But it was um, it was intriguing to me. So I thought, well, yeah, that that sounds like something we could do. And and uh, he was talking about, you know, he has a, a friend that could maybe come down and play. And I said, um, and I said, well, you know, I co-present with Warren, and he said, Warren, I remember Warren. They played. I didn't even know this, but they played uh, blindfold blitz at Starbucks here in Houston when Timor was in town once when he was uh, doing his tours, kind of preparing to set the world record. And um, he said, I can do that with Warren. And I said, well, okay, well, I have to ask Warren. Because, you know, I can't just volunteer Warren's service. Hey, Warren. <laughs> you play. Uh, <laughs> so, so I asked Warren, and, and Warren was uh, excited by the idea and, um, and agreed to it. So then what we decided to do is we decided to get Timor to come to Houston to do the camp that a lot of you participated in this morning. And the simul, the tandem simul with Warren this afternoon, which will be in about 45 minutes or so. And, um, 
And so that's really cool uh, that, that we could have uh, the world's current world record holder in blindfold chess fly halfway across the world because literally three days ago he was in Moscow um, to, to join us for this event. And, um, and so that's, that's, that's really special. That's something that, you know, when Warren and I started doing this three months ago, three years ago now, just as a kind of a monthly lecture to the chess club members, we didn't anticipate, you know, that it ever reach these proportions. We didn't anticipate we'd be streaming live and, and all that sort of thing. So um, really happy to have everybody here today. Glad you all could make it. And I hope you enjoyed the camp this morning. And I'm sure you're going to uh, find the simul um, awe-inspiring. Um, so without too much further ado, let me get into the history of blindfold chess. Now, if you come to our lectures before, you know that usually I do history part, Warren does game analysis part. Um, this time, we thought it'd be prudent to take a little easier on Warren and not give him game analysis duty because he has to play nine of you. And this is a very, very difficult feat. Um, I'll get to how difficult of a feat it is here in a bit. But uh, so because of that, this is, and because of the interest of time, this is just gonna be history and not so much uh, game analysis. The games will come later when we do the simul. So history of blindfold chess, I have uh, on the screen for you, George Poltanowski, who's certainly the most famous American a blindfold chess player. Um, so, presented by, and I leave this blank because you know what? Uh, today, we have a live camera. So I have Warren over, God, it's all backwards on. And Timor just, he was over there and he stepped out to uh, take a phone call, but uh, he'll be back. So we're presenting this today and uh, we certainly hope you enjoy it. All right, so, and just FYI, I am actually a teacher and a librarian by day. Uh, Warren is a computer scientist. Timur is a professional uh, chess player, though. He travels all over the world doing tournaments and, uh, and presentations. And there he is. Yeah. And, um, and presentations. And so he lives a very, uh, uh, a life that in some ways I envy. And in some ways I, I just can't wrap my head around, you know, traveling. Uh, as much as he does. So for this lecture, I used this book. Elliot, you, if you've been, seen these lectures, you know I like using books. I always use books. And this book by Elliot Hurst and John Knott is published by McFarland and Company. And if you know anything about the lectures that we've done for this program, you'll know that McFarland is my favorite chess publisher. And this book is outstanding. It is your typical high quality, very well researched McFarland book. I'm only going to get into um, one aspect of the book. The book actually talks about the history of simultaneous blindfold displays, which is what I'm going to talk about because that's where our um, guest is best able to um, speak. And then I'm going to leave off the part about the psychological implications about playing blindfold chess, like the training methods, the memory methods. And I'm going to leave off um, the, the games that they put in there. So I'm leaving off essentially two thirds of this very excellent book, partly because uh, I don't have nearly enough time to cover it all. And partly because I really think that, um, that, you should, that you should pick it up if you find this topic interesting. All right, so chess, as you probably know, goes way, way back. This is a carving on, um, in, in uh, Kuala Lumpur. This is the Angkor Wat. And chess has spread all over the world, starting really in India. Now, I'll tell you that this map, even though it's a decent explanation for how chess has spread, it's very flawed in a couple of ways. Um, chess arrived in Spain a lot earlier than it says. It says 1300. Chess probably arrived around 1000 AD or, or CE Common Era. Russia had arrived more like the 11th century or the 1100 the early 12th century, so it was about four or 500 years earlier than what you see here. But the point is chess started in India. It's been known by many names and it's spread throughout many different countries where sometimes it, uh, you adopt different variations of it, like shogi in Japan. And sometimes it's spread you know, through various ways into Europe, where in Spain in the late 1400s, it really took on its current form. The role of the queen was vastly changed and there's a great book on that. Um, and other rules were added later on, like en passant was added later on, castling, the rules of castling were added later on, but it's really around the late 1400s that chess as we know it really takes shape. That's when we start 
fixing where we put the king, where we put the queen, as opposed to leaving it up to the player which square they want to start on, etc. The point is, blindfold chess has been played for a long, long time, but it's been played in a very different form than we play it today, and that many of us played it this morning. So if we look back, maybe the first blindfold player we can find in history goes back to Persia, 700 AD, 700 Common Era. Now, sometimes when we look at people who play blindfold in antiquity, or in the Middle Ages, I should say, this is the Middle Ages, not antiquity, they actually played a variant of blindfold chess where they touched the pieces to feel what was where. They didn't look, but they touched to feel, okay, that's a bishop or a vizier or whatever they called it. That's a uh, you know, a rook or an elephant or whatever it was called in, in that particular culture. And they, um, they made their moves that way. Later on, or during this time, some people were able to play without touching the board just by memor memoring, remembering the pieces and calling out their moves. But calling out moves was very clunky. In the Middle Ages, you wouldn't, now we have an algebraic chess notation, which is really nice, you know, knight f3, simple. Now we have to, back in the Middle Ages, it was very clunky to say all that, right? Now today in the simul, uh, there is going to be a, um, a delay between the time I relay a move to Timor and Warren and the time that they respond. But I can relay that fairly quickly and not nearly as clunky as, as how it used to be. If you want to learn more about the history of chess, the definitive book on this is still Murray's Treatise, which was written in the early 20th century. So it's written over 100 years ago now. But what makes Murray's work so distinctive is he actually learned Arabic and Persian and a couple of other languages so that he could study primary sources in those languages, which is uh, pretty darn impressive. So, um, so this was, you know, there was blindfold players in ancient Persia, in ancient Syria, and supposedly some of these players played up to 10 board simuls. Now, obviously, we have no written records of this. Perhaps the first person that we know of or really strongly suspect to have played three, a three-board blindfold simultaneous event was a Jesuit priest named Giovanni Saccheri. And Saccheri lived in Turin in Italy, and he was known not only for playing blindfold chess and si simultaneous blindfold chess, but he was also known for his outstanding memory. He could hear a sermon and recite it from memory after just one hearing. So it wasn't just a strong visual memory, also had a near perfect auditory memory. We're going to encounter this sometimes in the chess players we look at. Some of them had very, very strong uh, memories in general, and some of them had very, very strong memories for chess boards. The first, but we don't have any of the games here, so we only have accounts of what he played. The first person we know of was Philidor. Now, almost everybody who studied chess for any period of time knows the name of Philidor. Philidor was a famous French player, but you may, not all, you may not know that Philidor was actually a musician by training. I believe clarinet, and he was a composer. And he composed this, um, several musicals, and a few of them are still performed today, very rarely, but sometimes. He was a court musician in the court of uh, Louis the, let's see, I think he would have been Louis the 15th or Louis the 16th. So he was a court musician, he followed in his father's footsteps, but he was a chess player on the side. Now his friends really worried about his ability to play blindfold simultaneous chess. They thought that it would A, drive him mad, or B, at least diminish his musical gifts. And it certainly didn't drive him mad. But this is gonna be the first instance of many where chess players are, or blindfold chess players are cautioned by other people not to play blindfold chess because it can drive you nuts. And um, <laughs> what, one of the strongest proponents of this theory was Mikhail Botminik, actually. Uh, he, he did not uh, think much of blindfold chess or blitz for that matter. Um, and, and, and that's actually a fairly common um, idea in Russia in the 20th century for reasons that I'll get into a little later on. So this record stood for a while, stood for a long while until Kazaretsky broke this record in 1851, so 60, 70 years later. So Kizaretsky was born in Estonia and he later moved to Paris where he became the resident chess professional at the Café de la Régence. And if you remember my lecture on Paul Morphy, 
You'll remember that that's where Paul Morphy played when he went to Paris and did his European tour. It was one of the places he played. And I'll actually get to a blindfold signal that Morphy did there later on. But Kizaretsky was the uh, resident expert. Incidentally, the Café de la Régence was a really interesting um, cultural place. Benjamin Franklin used to play chess there. Um, Napoleon used to play chess there. That's where uh, Karl Marx and Engels, you know, who wrote the Communist Manifesto, that's where they first met and started talking about their different philosophies. So this cafe occupied a very important cultural place. And Kizarezky, sorry, was the resident expert there for many years. Just, just to clarify, the plus one, minus one, and equals zero is uh, the wins, the losses, and the draws. Yeah, otherwise, otherwise, that would be a pretty tough equation to understand. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. Too, <laughs> so yeah, three wins, one loss, one draw, or one loss, zero draws. So a, a percentage of 75%. I've reproduced these from the appendix in this blindfold chess book. And there's something pretty interesting with the percentage that I'm going to talk about with some of the simultaneous displays. So breaking Kizaretsky's record, Louis Paulson, who originated, who was born in Germany, but he migrated to Dubuque, Iowa, of all places, where he became a tobacco merchant. He went into business with his brother. And Paulson was a fairly strong chess player. In fact, he was the second strongest chess player in the United States after Paul Morphy. Yeah, Paul Morphy basically, uh, when they played sighted or blindfold, Morphy uh, thrashed him. It wasn't that close. But Paulson was certainly the second best chess player in the United States. And he made his mark as a blindfold player. So his first exhibition that he, where he broke the record, 1857, not too long after Kizaretsky, and he had a good percentage. He went on to approve upon this, breaking his own record in Dubuque, Iowa, where he lived. Now, this simul actually took two days. What that means is they adjourned it. So they reached a certain position. They adjourned it. He promised not to analyze the games in between. And when they came back, <laughs> Paulson actually called out each board and said where each piece was on each board from memory. And most of the blindfold players could do this or, and did do this when uh, games were adjourned for uh, time reasons. So this simul took place over two different days and Paulson won it pretty convincingly. But as you might imagine, his competition in Iowa probably wasn't that, probably wasn't that strong. Well, he broke his own record again the very next month, we think, again in Dubuque, but we don't know the score for this, nor do we know the exact date. So I'm not going to dwell on it too much, but understand that Paulson was constantly trying to better himself. He was constantly working to uh, improve his performance, and he would end up breaking his record, own record again in Chicago uh, just two months later. So this time we do have the game scores and we do have records of most of the games themselves. Well, actually, I think most of these games were lost to history. Unfortunately, this is true for a lot of the blindfold simuls we have. But uh, Paulson scored very well in this exhibition. And then the very next month, he breaks his record again. So 12 board simul. And so Paulson is the uh, certainly the best chess player in the world at this time. And I want to give you kind of a little bit of the flavor, both of this book and for the environment. So let me read you a bit um, of what the, uh, the periodicals at the time said. Let me find it here. The most stupendous feat of memory ever attempted in the world has just been successfully performed by Lewis Paulson. On the evenings of the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th of May, 1858, he succeeded in playing 10 games mentally without sight of men or boards, playing nearly 1,000 moves without an error. That's a tall claim, but I digress. <laughs> and frequently correcting the errors of his adversaries. Mr. Henry Henris or Harris of Chicago writes, in the midst of one of the games, a piece was moved to a certain square. Paulson demurred to that move already uh, move being made, alleging that the square was already occupied. There was a moment of painful suspense, and many of the bystanders shaking their heads thought for once his astonishing memory had proved treacherous. But he soon dispelled all doubts by giving the position of the pieces and pawns as, it's, as they stood at the close of the evening before, and recapitulating the moves made sense, actually stated the exact time at which his opponent's mistakes had been committed. So it goes on to give uh, a, a little more color on that. 
Now, blindfold simultaneous events were always open to spectators. For one, they're very spectator friendly because to a lay person, and even to a lot of us, blindfold chess is pretty darn impressive. In fact, when I was at Super Nationals and uh, Maurice Ashley was introducing the various grandmasters and champions present, when he introduced Timor, he said, and this is someone who does something that even us grandmasters shake our heads at. So it is impressive when people do blindfold simultaneous displays and they are spectator friendly to a certain extent. But as you might imagine, when you bring in a bunch of people who are not chess players, they may not always respect the environment that is conducive to playing chess. And this happened in one of Paulson Simels. It says, Disinter disinterested bystanders considered the behavior of his opponents and certain spectators as very discreditable. They freely handled the pieces and, contrary to all rule and law, consulted together over the moves, thus procrastinating the contest and illiberally putting much extra strain on Paulson's chess faculties. Now, what they mean is twofold. First, sometimes a master or a strong player will refuse to play in a simultaneous exhibition because if they win, no big deal. Okay, they beat somebody in a simul. Wow, whoop de do. And if they lose, oh my gosh, you lost in a simul. So a master oftentimes feels that they have little to gain or lose by participating in a simul. But in the past, that has not always prevented them from going around and freely handing out advice. So they'll go board to board and say, <laughs> Timor is cautioning our resident master, don't do that. Um, and they'll go board to board and they'll offer suggestions. And if nothing else, that extends, that extends the contest. Because as you can imagine, if there's only one saving move and everything else loses and you feed someone that saving move, then you're prolonging the contest substantially. So that's one problem with spectators. The other problem is sometimes people want to talk about what they see. And obviously, um, being able to juggle 12 boards simultaneously is quite the feat, much less 48, as we'll get to. Um, and you want to have an environment conducive to that, which means you want to keep it fairly quiet, obviously, when you can. And we're going to certainly impose that a little later today. So spectator sometimes was very difficult to manage. Well, you may be asking, OK, what about Paul Morphy? Well, Morphy gave a blindfold sign a little later in the aforementioned Café de la Régence and he scored quite well. Now, Morphy had a winning record against Paulson. They first played in the American Chess Conference, Congress, the first annual American Chess Congress, and they both went undefeated into the finals. And Morphy won their head-to-head -head match plus five minus one equals two. Really a dominant performance. And Morphy would go on to beat lots and lots of people by similar match scores. Morphy actually Unlike Paulson, who sometimes would carry over his uh, simul over several different days, Morphy actually did it all in 10 hours without leaving his chair. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have a hard time not even going to the bathroom for 10 hours, <laughs> much less focusing on chess or not eating. And apparently he drank some water and maybe some coffee from time to time, but that was it. He just sat in his, his chair for 36 or for 10 hours. And, um, and the next morning, Morphy wakes up at like 6 a.m. and he gets his assistant up and he dictates all the games and he starts just flying through variations. If you would have played this, could have played this and this. I mean, not only was he, um, not only was he enthusiastic about it, but he was still energized and still hyped up about it. And I find that um, crazy. We'll, we'll encounter that a little bit later with Al Yakin when they talk about sometimes him being the freshest person in the room at the end of a 16 or 18 hour simul. I, I, I'm not sure how that's possible, but anyway. Okay, not to be dissuaded, Lewis Paulson extends his own record. He triples his original number of five by extending it to 15. In, again, in Dubuque in 1859, we don't know the month, we don't know the match score. We just have accounts that it was 15 players. So it, unfortunately we don't know the percentage, but chances are it was probably a pretty good percentage because um, I'm imagining that he didn't get very tough competition. You don't think much of those Iowa players, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I don't... I don't... Uh, I'm going to switch to the camera to record my embarrassment here. Um, I don't... 
I don't know how developed the chess scene was in Iowa in 1858 and 1859. Let me put it that way. <laughs> I know. I know that there were players in New York. I know there were players in New Orleans. And I believe that chess existed in San Francisco at the time. Maybe. If not, it would soon. But I hadn't. Uh, Paulson's the only person I've ever heard of from Iowa um, playing chess, at least at any decent level. All you're going to hear about him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get a bunch of angry uh, comments from people from Iowa. Uh, sorry. So before I continue on with the record of simultaneous boards, I want to digress just a moment and tell you about Joseph Henry Blackburn. Now, Actually, I want to, I want to interrupt. Oh, uh, no problem. Note of Paulson. Uh, another interesting historical note is that the, the periodicals back then used to ob obsessively describe the, the vastness of Paulson's forehead. <laughs> they and, did. <laughs> they Luke did. I will tell you more about that, but they, they had this idea that uh, if you were really intelligent, you had a massive head, right? Because uh -huh. I mean, then your brain had to be really huge or something. Yeah, like that. That, that was <laughs> that was a thought. That's an Asian thought. Oh, well, it's Asian as well. It, yeah. it was All a. Asians think that if you grow up with a big forehead, you're smart. <laughs> <laughs> and and this is not the first. It's not the last time we're going to encounter this. But yes, there there was this idea, and then. This is actually from Staunton, the famous chess player Staunton, who wrote, We gather from the American papers that Lewis Paulson is in appearance tall and muscular, his face smooth, hair light, eyes gray, compact facial muscles, and a head of prodigious size. <laughs> his head is the largest of any man in the United States. <laughs> in temper, he is modest, placid, and reserved to a fault. He is very abstemious, using no other stimulant than strong coffee and soda water, of which he partakes freely during play. He is further described as performing his marvelous feats with the greatest of ease and without experience, headache, or uneasiness of any kind. He has frequently assured his friends that he can play better without the board than with it. And that was published in the London News in 1858. So yeah, he had a big head, and apparently Blackburn also had a big head. Apparently he had to bring his own hat with him because he was sure that he wouldn't be able to find one big enough to buy in the United States. Because <laughs> he was like a size 19 or so, I don't know, a, a big head. Um, Blackburn actually has the record, at least as far as I know, for either classical, like sighted, or blindfold chess in that he announced a mate in 16. So he's playing blindfold. This was the position on the board. I'm sorry, I couldn't get a higher resolution than that. And Blackburn, playing as white, amounts a, uh, announces a mate in 16. And he was right. It was a mate in 16, although if Black managed, mismanaged it, it would have been a mate sooner than that. But um, as far as I know, this hasn't been equaled or, or surpassed in, uh, in, in chess history. OK, so back to our records for simuls. Now, Zucker Tort, you may know of for his matches in the Steinitz lecture, I talked about Zucker Tort. And, um, and Zucker Tort was a fairly strong, uh, well, Zucker Tort was many things. Among other things, he was a spinner of tails, let's say. Zucker Tort thought he was pretty much the best at everything. He was the best duelist with a gun or with a sword. He was the best card player. He was the best domino player. He was the best chess player. He was, and it's true, he was good at a lot of things. But it's also true that he exaggerated from time to time. Although we do know that he did actually achieve this record by scoring very well in a simul in London, England. It was adjourned. And um, the players were apparently very, fairly strong. In fact, none of them would have received greater than night odds against him, which tells me that they were like class A, class B players. So maybe like 1800 to 2200 ish in modern parlance, if you wanted to think of it that way. Now, Zucker Tort may have expanded upon this later. He may have had more um, achievements later on, but he died in his 40s. So he died at a fairly young age and he wasn't able to uh, surpass this feat in his lifetime. Instead, we would wait uh, almost 25 years until Harry Pillsbury or Henry Nelson Pillsbury came along. Now, Pillsbury is known for many, many things. He's known for um, first and foremost, winning Hastings in 1895, which was one of the biggest chess tournaments in history. He finished ahead of Lasker and Chigorin. Lasker, who was the world champion at the time, Chigorin, who 
Uh, many would consider to be, you know, top, uh, the second best player in the world at the time. And Pillsbury beat them both, uh, or finished ahead of them both. And he was also very good at simultaneous blindfold chess. He first played in February of 1900, where he equaled Zuckertort's record. And then in March of 1900, less than a month later, he surpassed him by playing a 17-board simul. And one thing that's fascinating about Pillsbury is Pillsbury is a very fast player. Now, Zuckertort and uh, Paulson, some of the, sometimes they took two or three days or four or five days to finish a simul. Pillsbury, on average, took about 40 seconds per move, sustained over all of those matches. That's a very, very fast rate. Um, we're going to see some times today where Warren and Timor are going to make moves that quick. But to average that over a course of a whole simul, that's a pretty impressive feat. Now, Pillsbury would go on to exceed this by, by uh, doing a 20-board simul, and this was actually the biggest uh, simul that he would ever do. So this was April 28th of 1900, and again, a very, very good score. Pillsbury was known for not just, he's the second player I want to talk about for his prodigious memory. Pillsbury wouldn't just be content with playing a simul where he was uh, playing chess, he would have a couple of card games going on the side. Whist was his game of choice. He'd have some checkers games going on the side. He would uh, have people call out numbers or words and he would memorize them as he was going. He would stop every now and then and dictate a sentence of a letter and then come back around and dictate the next sentence of the letter. He would, he would multitask to a, an extreme sense. And actually, this is something Timor was talking about last night about you know maybe trying to do a similar blindfold chess thing with a, a bunch of different games going on at once and frankly my brain just can't can't process that I don't I don't I, don't, I mean just playing one blindfold game to me is, is pretty darn impressive but I guess once you've played 40, 48 you start looking for other challenges um, and I want to talk to you a little bit about memory the librarian in me has to digress and I need to talk to you about this book by uh, Joshua Foer who is a, a journalist who went out to study the U.S. Memory Championship. As a journalist, he wanted to cover feats of memory. So he went to this memory championship where basically you shuffle a deck of cards, you give it to somebody. They look at the deck of cards and they memorize the order and then they recite it in order. And whoever can memorize the deck of cards fastest is the memory champion. And he was impressed by the feats that these people were doing, that these participants were doing. And he thought to himself, can I do this? And so he set out to work on it. And he spent about a year training pretty intensively. And he developed a lot of techniques, some of which have been around for a long time. One is called the Memory Palace. The Memory Palace, I don't want to do any disservice to his book. He talks about the history, goes back to ancient Rome. But basically the idea of associating something with a place, because our brain works very well with remembering places. So what Foer would imagine is walking into his house and seeing an image which would correspond to a group of three cards in front of him. And then he would look to his left and he would see another image, which would correspond to three other cards. And then he would have this tour, this circuit in his house memorized. And he would just basically place the cards there mentally with these images and then just walk around his house. And that's how he'd recite them in order. And what's interesting about this story, perhaps the most interesting about it is, Thor actually won the US Memory Championship. Here he was as a layperson, someone who had never done this before and just thought, huh, why don't I give this a shot? And a couple of years later, he actually wins the national championship. He memorized a deck of cards in like a minute and 52 seconds, shuffled at random. It took him like five minutes to recite it, but, you know, just thumbing, minute and 52, that's like, what, three seconds of cards, something like that? That's really fast. So anyway, excellent book. I'd highly recommend reading it. Um, digression ended. Let's go back to Pillsbury. I said, uh, I said that he stopped at 20. I was mistaken. He actually stops at 22. Let me get to the 21st, though. Okay, first, look at the score. Plus 3 minus 7 equals 11. Now, on the surface, that looks bad, but let me explain this. Pillsbury was playing in a tournament in Hanover, Germany, and at the time, they often had tournaments with several different divisions. Master division, which is what he was playing in. Then they had, like, the um, candidate masters, if you will, and the experts. They had like division two, II, division three. What Pillsbury did is on a rest day, <laughs> he challenges 21 people from category two and, ca and the best players from category three 
So these are all like experts to a blindfold simul. And a lot of people, including Koltanowski, claim that this was the strongest opposition anybody's ever faced in a blindfold simul. So when you look at it, yeah, his score wasn't that great. But this certainly goes down in history as a really, maybe the toughest feat ever attempted because A, it was on a rest day. And apparently he went back the next day and just played his, his classical match just like normal. Um, and B, he was playing against the strongest players from divisions two and three. So um, that, that's, that's quite the challenge. That's actually a really strong challenge, even in our standard sighted simul. If you were, you know, if, if Timor were to sit down 21 um, players from like 1900 to 2300 and play them all simul, you know, on, as a simul at the same time, that'd be a really tough feat, right? Um, so you can imagine blindfold to be even tougher. Well, I'll just add the, well, uh, a couple of things. I, I, interestingly, I guess the very strong players in the simuls, at times I'll, Finish the quickest and actually with a good result. <laughs> You'll have that's when you have the miniatures. Including the the ultimate world record event, where I played against the master level player and I was one of the first games to go. What what, do you, what do you was that just uh, one of the an best opening win? Oh okay, it's just uh, I just went for for an adventure as I saw was uh, possible and then it just kind of it offered its chances. And then another interesting point with. Uh, uh, some of those really tough uh, simuls. Uh, I was speaking with the Spirit on Scambris from Greece, the Grandmaster. We actually did a sighted uh, event in Sandem on 50 boards. It was pretty fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he, was, he was talking about his experience of getting simuls. And once he did a, an event uh, with a blind uh, team from Yugoslavia. It's blind national team from Yugoslavia, and uh, he had he had some great positions, but then all of a sudden this guy ended up being tough. And this is one of those uh, matches, one of the few matches where he actually lost six and a, six and a half to three and a half. Wow! <laughs> so you know whatever he congratulated, he's like, oh man, I'm surprised. You know you guys have played the amazing. And then uh, a year later, uh, he's getting off the bus, you know, for like some kind of tournament, some Olympiads or something. And then all of a sudden, just uh, talking with the, his friend, and then somebody taps him on the shoulder. He turns around. He sees one of those players. He says, oh, uh, Grandmaster Scambris, uh, how are you doing? And he's like, how did you, how did you know it was me? I was like, oh, I remembered your voice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So, Pil Pillsbury broke his own record again in 1902. Um, and this was a lot stronger result from him, but again, the, the, his opposition wasn't quite as strong. And uh, he would go on to play other simuls in, uh, in like San Francisco, but he would never exceed after this 16 game simuls. And Pillsbury ended up dying in 1906. He died at a very early age. And, uh, and at the time, his obituary in the New York Times reported that it was an, quote, illness contracted through overexertion of his memory cells. <laughs> <laughs> that was the party line, or that was, that was uh, what they maintained. And this actually created part of the stigma around blindfold chess. Well, it killed Pillsbury, you know? <laughs> this isn't what killed Pillsbury. Uh, Pillsbury died of syphilis, which... Uh, Given our, our, our PG audience, I won't explain how he contracted it, but I'll say it was in Moscow in, in uh, 1895, and it developed, uh, and he ended up dying of it about 10 years later. His family, for obvious reasons, didn't want that stigma associated with his name, and so the the um, the papers reported it was you know overexertion of memory cells, whatever the heck those are. <laughs> so the first person to break Pillsbury's record was uh, Richard Reddy. He did this in the Netherlands in 1919, right after the end of World War I. Now, I should mention that um, there was a Soviet player named Ostrogsky who had apparently done a 23 board blindfold simul. And this is why probably why Reddy chose to do a 24 board simul, but the authors of blindfold chess don't recognize that as a record. And I'm inclined to agree because Ostrogsky basically not only did uh, some of his opponents played multiple boards at the same time, 
So it wasn't like he played 23 opponents. And who knows how many he played. And uh, some of the other circumstances around that match are a little suspect. So they get into it in the book. I don't need to reproduce it. But that's probably why Reddy instead went from 24 to 20, uh, from 22 straight up to 24. Now, Reddy was fairly notorious for... We talked about Pillsbury having an amazing memory. Reddy was notorious for his forgetfulness. Reddy would forget his umbrella, his briefcase. Apparently, he had this yellow leather briefcase and if you found his briefcase it said that ready it, it indicated that ready was no longer there but it was evidence of his passing like he par apparently lost his briefcase all the time and people had to you know track him down oh you know grand Ma or uh grandmaster ready or mr ready you've forgotten your briefcase um this apparently bit him pretty hard and his his brother wrote a biography of him and his brother claims that ready lost his phd dissertation his one and only copy of his PhD dissertation <laughs> right before he submitted it. And so Reddy did not obtain his PhD in mathematics. And apparently he was so distraught over this, he even considered suicide. Um, fortunately for, for everybody in the chess world in general, he didn't go through with that. But the point is he had a actually a fairly poor memory for some of the most mundane things, but he was a brilliant, brilliant chess player, which, um, so I've given evidence supporting the fact that sometimes blindfold simultaneous players have prodigious memories. And now I've given a counterexample. So there's a spectrum here, if you will. His record was shortly broken by his friend, uh, Julia or Julius Breyer, originally from Slovakia. And Breyer, along with Nimzovich and Reddy, were kind of the fathers of the hypermodern school of chess. You've probably seen his name on various books. He helped co-author them. Breyer had a prodigious career, but unfortunately it was cut short by tuberculosis at the age of 28. So kind of like Pillsbury and kind of like uh, Zuckertort, you know, again, lives cut short. And there are plenty of others that could have been cut short, but that were not, um, notably due to war. Uh, we'll get to a notable example here shortly. Now we come to Alexander Alyakin, who the authors of this book consider the best blindfold player of all time. And um, Timor, I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot. What, what's your thought on that assessment? I love him, uh, the, the greatest blindfold chess player. Yeah, what do you think of the, the authors main to contend well, that? But that was before you uh, uh, broke your record. Definitely, uh, I uh, relate to a lot style of executing uh, how, how he approached blindfold chess and with the uh, I'd say same level of enthusiasm and attacking uh, uh, style that he played uh, his uh, tournament chess, uh, and I'll definitely give him credit for you know, the accomplishing uh, the level of uh, uh, achievement that he was managed that he managed to pull off in in his battle also with Kolpanowski, who mm -hmm. you know they were stepping you know kind of going hand in hand, you know, accomplishing their records. It's obviously a different style, a uh, different number of games, mm -hmm. I mean, which is, at that point, uh, that was... Uh, 26, his ultimate, yeah. Well, his ultimate, uh, this, uh, he started with 26, and then he ended, ended with, with 30... 34? 34 was Kolpanowski. Oh, so and 36. Been, might have been, no, I look uh, 35. In, uh, Kotonowski did get uh, Alokin eventually. Oh, yeah, yeah, he got 34. So, he, so I think uh, oh, yeah, he can finish at 32. Then. But I guess, you know, the style with which he played, uh, the, his, actually his circumstance in life, when I visited the museum uh, in, uh, uh, in Russia, it's a museum of chess, and they, they were talking about, uh, you know, 1921 when the, uh, the Soviet army came in and then the royal rule was... Uh, 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 taken over, or what do you call that? Uh, ousted, or ousted? Yeah, yeah, the oust happened. Uh, the a lot of the, the people of aristocratic descent uh, were persecuted, and so was uh, Alokhin. He was uh, actually he was about to uh, take a ship. He was about to uh, take off. You know, flee to Western Europe. And he was uh, captured, mm -hmm. and he was imprisoned. He was about to get uh, executed. Executed, yeah. and his friend, uh, uh, one of the chess friends, found out uh, that that was the case, and he kind of somehow was able to uh, bail him and get, get him out of there. And then eventually, 
he was able to survive and continue his practice and you know continue his uh, you know feats and tournament chess as well as blindfold chess. It's it's been almost three years now, but we did do a lec Warren and I did do a lecture on Al Yakin where we get into uh, the Russian Revolution and mm -hmm. if you're interested in the the history aspect of it, you can certainly uh, you can certainly uh, look for that on the channel. Um, Al Yakin was. Al Yakin actually got a start in blindfold chess by watching the exhibition that Pillsbury gave in Moscow way back several slides ago. Al Yakin was a spectator. He was not a participant. He was a spectator in that, and he watched Pillsbury in his blindfold feet. And Al Yakin started um, playing blindfold chess mostly because it, um, his parents took his chess set away at night so he'd go to bed. Although he, then he would just, you know, imagine it. And then at school, his teachers would take away his chess set too. So he wouldn't, you know, so they pay attention in class, but he would just whisper moves back and forth with his classmates. So by the age of 16, Al Yakin talks about the fact that he could do basically a five board blindfold simul without too many difficulties. So it was part of his training regimen, if you will. And um, at this event in New York, it's really interesting because the opposition was very, very strong. Some people consider this particular simul, this 26-board simul, to be the best simul ever given just because of the strength of the opposition. I'll read you a little excerpt about it. The seance, as usual in America, was excellently organized. However, it came as something of a surprise to me that the composition of my opponents was unusually strong. So this is Al Yakin writing. Suffice it to say that on the first 11 boards, there played first-class amateurs, the best representatives of Manhattan and Marshall Chess Clubs. Of names now known on the international scale, such people as Kashtan, Herman Steiner, and Kevitz could be mentioned. For this reason, one has to call the result 16 wins, 5 draws, and 5 losses entirely satisfactory. Um, as a correction to Al Yakin, Kevitz didn't actually play, but a couple of other strong players like Pincus and, and Tholfsen did play in the... Authors of this work uh, do excellent scholarship to point that out. Now, the Simo lasted uh, about 12 hours, and there was just a short break for Al Yakin to have dinner, and uh, and that's it. Afterward, he um, uh, he adjourned to uh, to have some some uh, a light meal and um, and replenish apparently his uh, cigarettes, which he kind of uh, was known for chain smoking during his simuls. So um, Al Yakin beats the record. And the, I want to point out something about Al Yakin's style. I don't know how much this means, but Al Yakin broke the record by a game and then went, mm, maybe that's not good enough. So the next time he set a record, he broke it by two games. So this was in Paris, and it wasn't uh, 28 opponents. It was actually 28 teams of four players working in consultation. So that's pretty tough. I'll read you a little excerpt. Last Monday at Paris in the Grand Hall of the Petit Parisien, the uh, Rue de Glian, um, Monsieur Alekin made a new world record in chess playing sans voir, that's blindfold, 28 games of chess simultaneously, of which he won 22, drew three, and lost three. He sat on the dais of the hall in a big armchair with his back to the opponents who were seated at two long tables and a cross table in the body of the hall. Monsieur Alekin had the white pieces on all the boards and began by calling out his first move at each board in succession. The play began at 10.20 a.m. and closed at 11 p.m. The players were drawn for, from chess clubs in and around Paris and arrangements were made for substitution at suitable interviews. Uh, Monsieur Alekin having decided to play on virtually play on virtually without break. One woman player refused offers of substitution and remained at her board for some 12 hours on end, losing at last. So a 12 hour simul, one sitting, again, this uh, is more in spirit with Pillsbury and it's more rapid play than we've seen from some of the other players. Moving on, Richard Reddy breaks Al Yakin's record. I want you to look at the dates here, Ready? February 1st, February 7th. Wow. Reddy is in Brazil, and he's planning a 26-board simul to break Al Yakin's record. And then he hears Al Yakin just set another world record at 26, and or, or, sorry, at 28. And Reddy's like, "Dang it!" So Reddy just last minute adds one player to the field so he could do a 29-board simul. <laughs> and later on, the two would there was this discussion in the press about who the world record actually belonged to, because Al Yakin had the better percentage; he had the higher number of wins. But Reddy had the higher number of boards. And, you know, we could debate which record is more meaningful. 
but it's kind of moot in uh, hindsight because this was broken um, several years later by George Koltanowski. We've, we have Koltanowski on the um, title slide, you saw him. And Koltanowski was born in Belgium, migrated to the United States, became a very famous American chess, not just player, but ambassador. He wrote chess columns in San Francisco for almost 50 years. And he toured all over the country. I know we have one person in our audience who actually had the fortune of playing him in a simul. Was that a blindfold simul? Yeah, a blindfold simul. Oh, um, uh, and we won't ask when you that look was. A little bit like Ask. <laughs> <laughs> we won't ask when that was in, in deference to uh, yeah, anonymity. You know what made this uh, particularly glorious? You know, you have that match uh, Lohan is doing. And uh, like, it probably had like, you know, a thousand people or something. Because now, now everything is like on TV and YouTube. Or back there, it's like you either stare at the wall or you can like, you know, go and like, you know, check out this like incredible feat happening. And also interesting point is like when, when they did their, when they set their records, uh, the news traveled, right? I wonder how that, you know, like newspaper communication, I don't know. Telegrams. Was it the... Pigeons who like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, how to figure it all out. Yeah. yeah. So, Alyekin wasn't really interested in, uh, Alyekin had won the world championship since he had set his blindfold simul record. He had beat Capablanca in their match and then defended against Bogo Yobov a couple times. And he, he didn't really show much interest in the blindfold simul record. But this changed when the World's Fair was occurring in Chicago. And they invited Al Yakin as kind of their guest of honor. And they wondered if he would, as part of their Century of Progress exposition, they wondered if he would play uh, a 32 board uh, blindfold simul to break the record. Now, at the New York simul that Al Yakin did, his teller, the person that he called out the moves to and making the moves on his behalf was Maroxi, Hungarian grandmaster. At this event, the person making the moves and calling them back out to him was Emmanuel Lasker, former world champion and grandmaster. So, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Timur Warren, Warren. I'm <laughs> I pale in comparison to them, but I'll do my best. <laughs> but, um, but this was an impressive finish. And, um, and after this, Al Yakin was able to reclaim the world record. And he said at this event, that he thought he could play 35, 40, even a 48 board simul, blindfold simul. He thought he could, his memory could hold that many, but he never had the opportunity to play that many. Instead, um, he went to Puerto Rico and he offered to do a 40 board simul there. 40, four zero. And the players at the Puerto Rico Chess Club in San Juan said, no, we'd rather a sighted one because it was like 10 o'clock at night and they didn't want to stay there like, you know, all throughout the night. They wanted to... Are we yeah, so Al Yakin beat them all in like, or most of them all, I think there are a few draws, in, in like two hours instead of 12 hours, and they all got to go home. But um, interestingly enough, Koltanowski is going to come along and, blur and break Al Yakin's <clears throat> record, but I want to tell you about something that Al Yakin and Koltanowski actually did together. Um, Al Yakin did, played a tandem blindfold simul with Landau, a, um, a Dutch chess master, Salo Landau, where they alternated moves. And the authors call this leapfrog chess or piggyback chess. We're gonna call this tandem blindfold chess today. So they did this without consulting with each other. They played six boards and they went plus two minus three equals one. A couple of weeks later, Al Yakin teamed up with Koltanowski in Antwerp in Belgium for a similar tandem display this time um, on six boards with several strong players comprising teams at each board. And they went plus three minus one equals two. So the blindfold tandem record, if you want to consider it as such, was six boards until uh, Timor broke it with Mark Lang um, a year or two ago. A year ago? Oh, that was a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago in, in Germany. Yeah. And what we're going to try to break again today. But to give you a feel for how hard this is, um, Al Yakin believed that Koltanowski was the second best blindfold player in the world. No doubt who he thinks was the best, okay? <laughs> Himself. <laughs> but, um, but Koltanowski was really apprehensive about playing with Al Yakin because he was such a strong player. 
Koltanowski probably reached about IM strength. He was never a GM, a strong IM, but never a GM. Al Yakin was the equivalent of a super GM. Pretty intimidating to be paired up with somebody who is, um, who's that strong of a player. You don't want to screw up their game, you know? Um, but Koltanowski said that he was much more tired than if he had played 30 regular simultaneous blindfold games. Six tandem blindfold simul games for Koltanowski was harder than 30 individual blindfold simultaneous games. Afterward, Al Yakin proposed to Koltanowski, hey, we should go on tour. We should go do these exhibitions around, around the world. And Koltanowski said, no, <laughs> no, it's too hard, right? So to give you, this was six. Today we're attempting nine, just to give you a feeling for uh, the challenge that Timor and Warren have well, set for themselves. Well, I'm sure you're going to get to No that, pressure. But, but he's, he certainly uh, uh, was uh, famous for exaggeration. That's true. Uh, like some incredible stories, which a lot of people love him for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he, he loves spinning tales, he, a lot like Super Tour. night tour, which was quite incredible in itself. The blindfold night tour? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you give him a square, he'd start a night there and then visit all the other squares without repeating any squares. So um, I mentioned Koltanowski. He broke the record in uh, Scotland in 1937 with a very strong score, no losses, 10 draws. However, this is something I haven't talked about until now, but the authors point out 47.1% of the games played ended in 16 moves or less. What that means is sometimes his opponents would forfeit early, they would resign early, and sometimes they would offer a draw early, and he actually accepted some of those draws. So the authors of this book make the point that sometimes these displays are somewhat tainted by the percentage of quick draws, and they look at the number of, or results, they, number, they look at the number of results at 16 moves or fewer. And they consider anything below 10% of the total number of boards to be a, a fairly good uh, uh, viable attempt. Anything over 10% is suspect, and 47.1% is really suspect. So that does tarnish a little bit the uh, idea there. Okay, um, going up from Koltanowski, we have to go up way up, and we have to go to Miguel Nydorf. And we've got about 10 minutes. We're almost done. Sorry, we're going a little long. Miguel Nydorf originally uh, went to Argentina to play in the Olympiad in 1939. And as you may recall from various lectures, World War II started while the Olympiad was going on. Several of the teams, uh, like the English team, decided to go back to England uh, and just forfeit the remainder of their games. Some people decided to stay in Argentina. Nydorf was one of those people because Nydorf was Jewish and he knew that if he went back to Europe, he would face persecution and, um, and perhaps worse. So he stayed in Argentina and he made a life there. And sadly, uh, and I talked about this in the Zurich 1953 lecture, Nydorf had a wife and daughter who died in the Holocaust. And he lost a lot of other members of his family and a lot of his friends as well. But while he was in Argentina, it was very hard to get news back to Europe. Barely, barely hard to let his family know that he was okay and, and uh, give them a way to reach out and, and contact him. And so what Nydorf said is that he did these simultaneous displays, this one and the next one, to get news back to Europe, to try to reconnect with his family and friends to find out uh, how everyone was doing. He thought that this would get a lot of publicity and that uh, particularly in strong chess playing countries like Russia and other countries in Eastern Europe, and he thought maybe he could uh, get press accounts and get word to his family that way. Uh, we don't have any evidence that he did, but he did do this simul in Argentina, finished very strongly, but a lot of people did not consider this the world record. In fact, um, until 2001, most people consider that Koltanowski's mark of 34 was the world record. It took really the scholarship of these two authors and some, um, some helpers digging through eyewitness testimony and digging through newspaper accounts in Argentina to prove that this actually occurred and to find a lot of those games that were played. 
So we now accept that Nidorf broke Koltanowski's world record, but Koltanowski basically went to his grave maintaining, and justifiably so, that he was a world record holder because there wasn't enough adequate proof to the contrary, but now we have that proof. We know that Nidorf broke the record at 40, and crazily enough, he went on to 45 uh, a couple of years later after World War II. After this, Nidorf didn't do any blindfold simuls that we can find at all. After he got... Yeah, just one thing. Is, yep. is, I, I don't know if you were going to mention, but uh, as one of the players that uh, competed in uh, Nidorf's uh, event, uh, world record event in Brazil, actually uh, joined in and played in my blindfold match. Yeah, wow. in, interesting uh, connection there. He must have been really young when he played... Uh, yeah, when he played when he played in the, the December event, uh, is in his nineties. Wow, ninety two, and he actually just passed away recently. Yeah, that that game is available online. I think it ended. I think he played quite well, and he, it ended in a draw, did it not? Yeah, uh, yeah. Wow. It did. Yeah. Wow. yeah. But actually, a, a curious a curious story to that too, where the connection was set up via online, and you can actually see the video. They show. Him on the screen, hey, this is your game here. You couldn't, you couldn't believe it. it was like, yeah. <laughs> oh, because <laughs> so it was, the whole setup, yeah. We had this assistance. So I was in Brazil, so uh, 8 in the morning, uh, I guess it's like 2 p.m. in Brazil or something. So towards like 7 or 8 p.m., he's like, oh, man, you know, I'm tired. I want to go to sleep. And then the game actually was one of the last ones, like in the top 10 last games to finish in my event. So I was like, man, this guy is like, you know, resistant. I won a corner at the beginning, and eventually I ended up uh, for uh, uh, down a piece for one pawn. And I was like, okay, a draw, <laughs> which was quickly accepted. But it turned out uh, the his assistant who set it up, uh, uh, Albert Silver, he's quite active in the, the publicity. He, you know, after uh, Luciano got tired and went to bed, he's like, he took over the game. Then Albert got tired several hours wow. later. He gave it to his assistant in India. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so Nidor broke the record convincingly. And uh, <laughs> this simul apparently took almost 24 hours, 23 and a half hours. No adjournments. So this introduces the idea that simuls, blindfold simuls are not just a test of your visualization. They're not just a test of your chess playing ability. They're a test of your endurance. And oftentimes people who are training for these will, will, will train by doing a lot of cardio. And I'll, we know that it, you know ever since maybe Bob Vinick, um, cardio and exercise has been a big part of professional chess players' regimen. You know, we know about Kasparov's runs along the beaches of Baku. You know, we know um, about T Timur's ultra marathons. As if, uh, as if it's not incredulous enough. Um, we, we know that endurance plays a very important role in this training in preparing for these, not just for the endurance, but I think maybe for the mental aspect. And, um, and, and that's something I'll, I'll let Timor explore more uh, here in a moment. But let me tell you about, whoops, let me tell you about since what's happened. Okay. Uh, Janos Flesch apparently played a 52-board simul, but we don't consider it a world record because there are a lot of problems with it. So I don't want to uh, spend too much time talking about it. Magnus Carlsen's done a lot of 10-board simuls, and he plays extremely strong blindfold uh, simultaneous chess. I don't know what his uh, potential is in terms of how many boards he can handle at once, but uh, I'm sure if he set his mind to it, he could make a serious run of the world record, but there's been no indication that he has any interest in that. There used to be a tournament, the Melody Amber tournament in Europe, uh, where both players would play blindfold with just an empty board in front of them. Obviously, it wasn't uh, it wasn't really fun to watch online. <laughs> but uh, but it turns out a lot of the strongest players in the world are really really strong at blindfold chess. Kramnik, Anand, you know the list goes on and on. Carlson, obviously, these are players who play very very well at blindfold, uh, perhaps not quite as strongly as they do in sighted chess, but but certainly very, very well in uh, blindfold chess. And this is basically where this book leaves off because it was published in, I think, around 2007. And they leave off 
more recent attempts like Mark Lang, who's a FIDE master in Germany, who Timur mentioned earlier as his partner for uh, the blindfold tandem simul record at seven boards a couple years back. Mark Lang set a record. He beat a Nidorf's mark at 46. Although, um, when you look at the number of draws in this, it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty high number of draws, but uh, I, I don't need to... I, I'm not really one to, to comment on this, but um, he had the record for a couple of years until uh, Timor came along and in December, you know, just about seven months ago, set the world record with an impressive performance in Las Vegas. And the percentage was, was very strong and obviously it, um, the competition was pretty strong as well. But, um, you know, there's really no reason for me to talk about this. I can just shut up and let... Uh, the person who actually broke this world record, speak a little bit about it. He's talked about it a little bit already, but um, but Timur, first maybe you could speak to the endurance aspect of it. How did you, it was 15, 16 hours? Uh, well, the total took, uh, uh, the total play time, I would imagine, is about 18 hours. Um, and you were on a spin actually, bike the whole including, time. Including some of the short breaks. Okay. Including some of the short breaks. Uh, but then including the long break that uh, occurred uh, uh, by accident, basically. Uh, it, it, you, do you guys hear about the, the, uh, with the thing we have going? Yeah. Perhaps not. Do you want it, uh, yeah. virtual chess podcast? Yeah. That was, uh, basically, we had the, uh, after about three hours of play, which had it happened earlier, that would have probably been a total mess, you know, just in terms of the, trying to settle the positions in, in my mind. Uh, but towards uh, yeah, towards uh, early afternoon, uh, all of a sudden the alarm went off in the building. The fire alarm. It was, a, it was a great space. It was beautiful. We were actually very lucky to have the kind of environment that, that we had during the during the event. Uh, just beautiful space out there on the university campus. Uh, we had the support, security. Everything just worked out beautifully. Had the technical hookups, there were like interesting movies going on, pictures, uh, lots of space for people, spectators to come in. Uh, my friend came in from Colorado, and he was actually, it was it was tremendous that he would, uh, you know, constantly as I'm playing, I'm like snacking on something, eating something, right? So he came in like fresh squeezed juice, like raw chocolate, you know, uh, fruit, like some cut vegetables. And at one point, I brought in. Uh, like a whole bowl of jalapeno peppers. And I couldn't understand that. I was like, I had one. I'm like, okay, that's great. But why a whole bowl? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it was kind of a joke or something. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, along with my food, they had to cook uh, stuff for, you know, uh, for participator for the participants. And uh, as he was uh, frying up some sausages in the kitchen, it, uh, apparently, the, oh, gosh. The, the the alarm detectors or the steam detectors, it just, uh, they just went berserk. And all of a sudden, the whole room had to get evacuated. And then everybody left, and then people came back to the to their boards uh, about uh, 30 minutes later, and we resumed. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of goes to work, to, goes back to, uh, you know, the experience of, uh, recounting what was happening on the on the boards uh, a certain amount of time down the road later, right? So <laughs> that's that's incredible. In endurance wise, I would say um, so. Eighteen hours of continuous play. Um, it, it, I, I feel like you know the the spin bike a aspect of it uh, certainly uh, helps and it make it gives that vitality that. Uh, uh, strength of effort, the strength of mind, and the rhythm to maintain and keep up a good pace. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that because when we were talking about uh, the training for cardio and I talked about the endurance aspect of it, um, it seems like when I hear you talk about it, you talk about um, the mental place that you're in when you when you play for long periods of time. And it sounds like, and I know you you practice other things like meditation, but it sounds like that mindset is really the key for you. And I think that's something that we all, um, in this busy world with distractions abounding, you know, it's something we struggle with, right? 
I feel like it's the uh, focusing on the experience of how everything unfolds, how everything's happening, is is per, is particularly uh, is is crucial, just because uh, it's kind of like it's like uh, trying to surf or or trying or trying to skydive or trying to you know you work on a delicate piece and then you trying to finish it right like it's it, it, it's like uh, it's like a certain uh, certain uh, wavelength certain uh, um, certain uh, a meditative uh, headspace uh, that you that you're most successful most efficient with how much energy you spend because you, if you really focus in and get try to go uh, you know like Kasparov style and then just really uh, you know, just several games that you can succeed, but then how about all the rest of the uh, the match, right? So the, this is kind of where you uh, can use your effort more uh, efficiently, more uh, effectively, to having that mindset. And the mindset is to really encompass uh, the whole experience and just really not resist, not try to necessarily make anything wild happen, not win right now. Because at times it's just like you're running out of energy. You feel like, oh, where's that final push? But they, yeah, this is a this is you playing strong players, so I'll give you a good fight. And uh, you know, you just gotta continue playing like normal chess, and you'll you'll have mistakes. And the times that I did make mistakes, I felt like I was trying to get some out of that game, and especially against the tougher opponent. And uh, I missed the moment that it was happening on. So I feel like the one of the most attractive parts of blindfold chess, the aspect of it is the uh, sense of presence that you got to maintain as you as you're uh, playing. You know, as soon as you uh, you know so the, the start dwelling on something else, and then you know you get distracted all of a sudden. You didn't hear the move, or you didn't visualize it correctly, didn't think about the correct board, and all of a sudden. If uh, at first actually like maybe like small noises or some conversation or uh, it was it was very distracting even when I was doing the small smaller events with experience actually now I feel like even on a busy street I can probably as long as we can communicate the moves more or less properly I can focus and be able to to visualize and do well uh, <laughs> but uh, you know those those uh, the distractions that you can cause to yourself are the are the most distractive ones, and the ones that, that they occur is when you lose uh, that uh, sense of presence, sense of unity with what's going on at hand. Uh, as, as soon as you do that, you're going to be in trouble. Whereas if you maintain that uh, uh, healthy perspective that this this is this is an experience you committed and then it's it's going on, it's kind of almost like spiritual essence to it. Uh, it uh, you can really t take uh, take a blindfold chest to the next level. Well, I certainly want to thank you all for for coming. Uh, without your participation in the camp this morning and in the simul this afternoon, we couldn't have this world record attempt. And obviously, I want to thank Timor and Warren for agreeing to attempt this record and for uh, sharing their perceptions on a blindfold chess and and just chess in general with. Uh, with you. I think we're really fortunate, as I mentioned earlier, to do that. I'm going to, um, I'm going to go quickly to uh, the last slide. I just want to thank some people who made some donations to, as you know, I have a YouTube channel and I, I don't monetize any of the content. You know, we don't really worry about any of that. This is not how we drive income, but to sponsor this event, to, you know, pay for Timor's flight and hotel stay and all that, I did s s put it out an appeal out there and some, some generous people donated. So I want to thank them for that. And then what I also want to do is kind of open it up to those of you in the audience. If you have questions, I'm going to get out of the way. You guys can ask questions. And, um, and I'm going to start uh, kind of moving some tables around so that we can facilitate the simul. But, um, and then whenever you are, uh, whenever here in about 10 minutes or so, we'll actually get everybody situated at their boards. We'll start the simul and then we'll, we'll go silent from there. Um, so by all means, if you guys have any questions, like I said, I'll move out of the way. You guys can go ahead. Where, where, where do you uh, currently live primarily? Um, I, I travel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, airports? Uh, airports, essentially. Yeah. <laughs>
Where do you go home? For the past for the past week or so, I had uh, I took some kind of a some kind of a flight like almost every day. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Where do you go home? Uh, uh, I'd say uh, Kansas. That's a Mark, uh, my friend uh, from uh, Karpov Chess School. Where actually, my mother is currently teaching. We're gonna have a chess camp uh, coming up. Uh, uh, let's see, in about three and a half weeks or so. July 16, 21. July 16 through 21. My mother generally teaches there. Works with the with the local schools in the area. And then when I come out and uh, have a chance to do a, a special event. We generally take advantage of it. Otherwise, last place that I lived uh, was Las Vegas. <laughs> so that's that's why I actually feel quite comfortable and have a lot of good friends as well. And the time that I spend most time anywhere around the United States is Texas. Where did uh? Is it your mother who taught you to play? Uh, well, my my grandfather was uh, working with me and just kind of you know just teaching me the basics. Then my father is a, a very competent player. Then uh, the school I went to had a really good uh, chess club, uh, good players to match and uh, gain some experience. So I was I was very fortunate to to be surrounded by a lot of good chess mentors. Uh, uh, Kind of at a beginner level as well. As later, all the way to grandmaster level, I had I had the legendary legendary chess coach Georg Konstantinovich Borisenko. He was actually he had the, he beat the, uh, several world champions. I think Spassky, Maslow. He almost beat Batvinik. His uh, his uh, one of his end games is published in the in the in the Batvinik's books. So I was, uh, I was working with him. He coached uh, two women's world champions, including his wife, <laughs> who was competing for world championship. So, uh, you know, that was, that was incredible to be raised in that environment. I feel like that's one of those uh, uh, circumstances that you may not necessarily pick in your life, but will certainly affect your uh, ability, your potential to reach the ultimate greatness. Whereas... I don't know how, how lucky Fisher was. It almost felt like he was, was kind of like on his own in many ways, right? But, uh, you know, he still had that chess club, right? Within walking distance. I actually spoke, uh, you know, I remember John Donaldson was doing a presentation. Fisher spent like first 15 years of his life within like three blocks away where he lived. <laughs> chess club, no school. I don't think he's in school. Yeah. How are you doing? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. But that's if you create that, if you have that kind of environment, uh, you're certainly fortunate. And in my family, in the culture, I think in Uzbek culture, uh, chess, uh, uh, chess club. stands at a, at a, has a, oh, high, a chess club. high position, just at, at least in terms of respect. Uh, currently, there's uh, half a dozen juniors, like, uh, you know, Kids who are like in the age between like eight and fifteen, who are like uh, like grandmasters or to be grandmasters within the next ten years. Yeah. So <laughs> it's pretty amazing. That's it. We're just about set, huh? We're getting there. Uh, would you like one table? Um, like your know, table like this, one for each of you? Um, I think I'll probably just share one. Yeah? Yeah, I'll probably share one. Okay. And then this, I think if you put the chair uh, in front of one of the legs. Put the chair, I'm sorry. You could, you could either do it this way, because uh -huh. then you could put the legs between them. Right. This will be fine, or by the chair, right? That'll probably be even better. Yeah. I like this chair and the, 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 the tables table and chairs. It's, yeah. Um, how light they are, huh? I picked the right photo shoot today, huh? Thank you very much. Yeah, cheers.
Okay, who is the lucky, uh, who's the lucky, uh, almost dozen? <laughs> uh, we can turn on the light. Some, some new participants, two, two participants, but the, the players who attended the camp, right? Uh, white, black, white, black. <laughs> so we decide, okay, based on, the, on your guys' good looks, we got to decide who's going to board one. Okay. <laughs> Mark, do we still have that uh, cherry chocolate? <laughs> the one we were the chocolate we were eating earlier today. No. I have some for you. Well, if you don't. <laughs> we're all out of thumbs, we're going to run out of chocolate. <laughs> Lucas, if you don't mind, uh, sir, we, we could uh, um, 